Welcome back, Zerke fans, to more of the December 1v1, or 2017 1v1 tournament. I remain your host, Chad, Fury333, and we are on to round five. Guy up in Hokomoko is going to be our first match, possibly the only one, depending on how long it goes. And we're on Otago, a map I've never seen. At all. And I'm very curious to see how the players work, because Hokomoko has never played 1v1 here, I guess, teams. And I don't know if Guy up has played it in at all. So this is going to be weird. Like, really weird. I honestly have no idea what to expect, considering that this map is unfamiliar. I mean, I literally have just no idea what to expect. What am I supposed to expect? It's Like I said, it's kind of like a more interesting Fields of Isis. Even though it's still utterly massive and kind of... Kind of terrifying. Looks pretty, though. I mean... That wouldn't be a bad place to visit. A little bit flat with mountains in between, but eh. That's the thing, because normally with mountains, like, you get some mountains, and then you get foothills, and it kind of creates plateaus across, and this doesn't work that way. Which is, I think, why I like Trojan Hills so much, even though Trojan Hills is also unrealistic. Regardless, yeah, you got... You got the setup. You got the choke points. You have very distant start locations. Although, it might work out like Vilas Mananaris, where it looks big, and it looks intimidating, and it looks like you can't do a whole lot of aggressive stuff. But it turns out that the matches take, like, 10 minutes. Just because there's so much you can speed around and so much money you can get right off the bat. That it actually doesn't matter. So, I'm curious to see how that's going to pan out. Because I honestly think this is going to be a fairly quick map. Especially considering that both players don't really know how this is going to work. And both players are very experienced. So they're going to be playing fairly aggressive. And also both are going for Klogibot Factory. So again... You're going to see a fair amount of aggression coming out from both players as the... Actually, not at the bat. Conjure's coming out first because both players realize this is a large map. Early Glaives aren't going to win them that many fights. But early Conjurers, that means early expansions. That means a lot more money. That means a lot more Glaives. And possibly more units on top of that. But of course, off the bat, we have the early Glaives. We have the early Glaive attacks. And we have the early glaives from both sides coming in, and that is exactly what I'd expect, as they want to scout out, and even then, wow, the glaives, relative to the size of the map, are not able to move that fast. I mean, the one thing is that compared to, say, Valus Madonatus, which does have the same actual size, the start locations are in corners. Valus Madonatus, the start locations are side to side, so you can theoretically have a, real, have a relatively short rush distance. In this case, though, corner to corner, as long as possible. So this is still going to be a bit of a long time for players to make contact. I mean, we're going to have a minute and a half into the game before the players even know what the other is playing in terms of factory. Which, I guess, isn't a huge problem because there is also a fairly long rush distance, so it's not like you'd be rushed by something huge. Although, to be fair, I could see Locust Rush potentially working just the sheer difficulty of your opponents dealing with it because it's a minute and a half before contact's made at all, let alone before a rush manages to get in. And we are seeing Hokumoko do just that right off there. First Glaive is managing to get in, managing to get into Gaiop's base. I mean, both players know the other's factory, and Gaiop is managing to win the, the center field game. Right, they're winning in the open fields, but they're not... And they're not getting into Hokumoko's base. I don't know if that's even their concern. I think at this point they're just trying to find a way of scouting out, trying to know exactly what Hokumoko's up to. Because that makes sense. I mean, that's what you want to do. If you don't know what's going on, make sure that Hokumoko, make sure your opponent can't just go around the map willy-nilly. Have some way of keeping tabs on what they're doing. Smart play, I, I gotta say. Still, though, Gaiap has... I mean, Gaiap is... I mean, they're setting up. I think, actually, they've got a really good position right now, considering they've gotten rid of most of Pokemoko's Glaives. Pokemoko themselves, they've got a slightly weaker economic position as well, haven't expanded to the north. And... They, where is that Conjurer? They had a Conjurer here, but I don't see... Oh, I see. It's helping build. Yeah, there's the Conjurer there, and then another one helping build the factory. So, not a whole lot of expansion going on there. Whereas, Gaiup, they focused heavily on expansion. They aren't focused too much on production capacity yet, which I say is the right choice. They're nowhere near accessing. I mean, once they get closer to accessing, then I would say it's worth worrying about. Or, like, 25 metal or so. But, right now, no big deal. They have enough units building things, they have enough going on, that, like, the next caretaker should definitely be helping out, or build, sorry, next conjurer should definitely build a caretaker or help out. Or this one, once it's done all this stuff, that'd be probably around the right timing. 
considering the expansion speed. But at the same time, Hokomoko, they are getting up there. They're getting closer. And it looks like they have a pretty concerted effort of Glaives coming in to possibly get rid of one of the expansions. Possibly get rid of the commander. This, If these Glaives manage to get together, I mean, four Glaives, or five Glaives, when dealing with an economy commander that is t totally unupgraded, five Glaives would be enough to kill them. Although that's assuming no defenses, which is no longer a valid assumption. So, I mean, again, not a whole lot of room for that. And Guy up pretty on point when it comes to figuring out what their opponents are up to. They have the radar coverage. They know exactly what's going on. Nothing's going to surprise them. So at this one, Hokomoko is pretty well set up for just keeping themselves alive. Guy up is pretty well set up for possibly going in. And Guy up is also very well set up economically. I mean, it's not quite yet, but within the next two minutes, we're going to see Guy up just explode along the western side of the map. I mean, they have the builders over here. The con Ooh, never mind. No, the Conjurer here is going to die. Nothing's going to save it. Guy up losing a Conjurer right before the Metal Extractor is done. I mean, that wouldn't have been able to get much money back. But that is going to slow down Gaia's expansion attempts. My previous statement about exploding on the western side of the map is going to be slowed down a little bit, but at the same time, Gaia trying to destroy as much as they can of the eastern side of the map, trying to destroy as much as they can of Hokomoka's force, getting rid of that Conjurer, totally worth it. They lost all Glaives? All but one Glaives? Hard to say yet. This battle is still un up in the air. All but one. Gaia has the opportunity to get rid of one of these metal extractors, possibly get rid of more, but I think they're just going to let the... I think they have bigger fish to fry. Not really focusing on the glaive, but still, the value of getting rid of that constructor. At the very least, they've evened things out a bit, but given that Gaiab had an economic advantage going into that fight, they have maintained the economic advantage coming out of it. The one thing that Gaiab, however, does not have so much is the army size. Especially in the position. I mean, Hokomoko has a nice unified army along, or reasonably unified army along the south here, where Hokomoko, they're getting a bit, but they have two fairly major clusters, which I suppose you can say also of Hokomoko. As Hokomoko will have one of the clusters go into Gaiop's forces and potentially get destroyed. Gaiop does know they're there and is turning back to deal with them. So Gaiop could again get rid of quite a bit of Hokomoko's force. Well, Hokomoko's force much less split up and much more able to get rid of the commander. The commander again unupgraded. These glaives have a perfect opportunity. They could get in here. They could destroy the commander or they could have. The opportunity is basically gone now. They might be able to get rid of a few glaives in the process, but they are forced to retreat. They they had the opportunity. It was a very short window, and it is now over. However, with the regroups coming in here, Hokomoko could still go for the commander, could still get rid of it. This is enough of an army. 11 glaives, more than enough to get rid of what's positioned here. Hokomoko, they've got this. As long as they don't lose the glaives to any, any tricky tactics, and they probably won't know, Gaiop's commander... They are going down. Hokomoko's got this, and they're playing it smart, moving the moving the glaives away as the the commander's about to die, or at least they were until obviously it was pretty much a done deal one way or the other. Nicely done there, though. Gaiop losing their commander, but also props to Gaiop. They had a storage already in place. They expected this might happen. They prepped for it. Where is that storage anyway? The storage is the real MVP. If I knew where it was, I would show it. But yeah, it, oh, there it is. Yeah, storage. Definitely worth having. And now Gaia up on the counterattack. Hokomoko did lose a lot of glaives in that in that fight. And yeah, Gaia lost a bit of their economy. And now there's a slight economic disadvantage for Gaia. But they have had a military advantage. And while Hokomoko does have the attrition advantage, a lot of that is a commander. And the commander, honestly, wasn't doing all that much considering the way the map is set up and the, what Gaia had built up. Gaia did not lose all that much for losing the commander. They had the storage. They had the economy already reasonably strong. They are accessing now due to the lack of energy, which is a big deal, because commanders do produce more energy than they do metal. But at the same time, Gaiab has enough glaze that it's not a big deal. They can just come in, tear apart everything. They did not spot the Conjurer, however, so this rebuild is going to be swift. Okamoko is going to get back to that immediately. But even then, Okamoko has their army split up on top of that, and... Gaiop able to rip apart these glaives without any issue, losing only a couple of their own, getting rid of about half a dozen of Hokomokos. And speaking of glaives on the other side of the map, Hokomoko getting a similar trait of their own and managing to spot a Conjurer, maybe get rid of it as well. Yeah, they're going to get rid of it. That Conjurer is dead. Or no, it's... Oh, does, it does manage to escape. Though back to the first side, Gaiop managing to get a bit more value off of those glaives, but it's... The attrition is starting to add up. 
Oh, if they were to go to the west, were to get rid of these two metal extractors, they would actually even out the economy and be in a much stronger position. Going forward is going to be suicide as the harpies are in place. And of course, the glaives coming in with defender's advantage. Reinforcements are right at the gate. And Gaiop does not manage to get rid of any more metal extractors with that glaive force. And in fact, Gaiop is, I would say, almost starting to fall behind when it comes to their glaive force. Their economy has managed to even up, but still, their attrition is slightly behind. Their economy is only slightly ahead. And their economy was behind for long enough that I would say it's a bit of a tricky situation as far as managing to maintain a military in that position. That being said, though, both players have enough knowledge of the other's movements that they can come in and counter them, so Guy shouldn't be losing too many glaives here if they stick together. But of course, the harpies are in place, and while there are gremlins that have been built to deal with the harpies, they are not in position quite yet. They are now moving into position, so that's going to be fine. But... It's still a bit tricky for Gaia to maintain that army as it is. As Hokumoko again pushes in, again does the candy get rid of a conjurer, again stops Gaia's advances. But at this point, with the center of the map, Gaia probably doesn't care too much about advancing. They probably care more about maintaining position, getting rid of these harpies, making sure their glaives have room to maneuver, and getting the south side of the map as well. So Gaia wants to keep that economic advantage going, and if they can do that, they've still got this game. Like, Gaia is still in a slightly more advantageous position. They still have a... They're still on the defense right now here, so they're able to hold back. They're able to retreat. They aren't doing so as much as I would expect them to, but they are able to retreat, forcing the Glaives into an awkward position because that's how this game works. Retreating is good. At this point, though, the Ronin are the... Apparently the core of the army right now, so Gaia is going to have a harder time getting into the Glaives, and with that force to see territory moving back and going to lose the Northwest as well. Hokumoko was able to get loads of damage here. I wasn't sure how much Hokumoko would get value. Like I said, they're a bit in the back foot, it seemed. But that is no longer Hokumoko's turn. An economic disadvantage into an advantage. They're going to increase that advantage, getting rid of here. And if it weren't for the fact that their energy is stalling, as Sigeto has pointed out, it would be an even stronger situation for Hokumoko right now. But that switch over to Ronin and Gremlins when they did meant that Gaiop just didn't have quite the force to maintain the frontline defenses against the Glaives which means that they aren't quite able to maintain as much of a defensive force against the Raiders, and now Hokumoko has gotten a 15 metal per second advantage. If it weren't for the fact that they have an energy stall leaving them roughly on par with Gaiop, this would be a very dire situation. Thanks to that energy stall, however, Gaiop does have a chance of getting back in here. They should be able to get rid of all of these glaives thanks to the, the Reaver, the two Reavers. And this light reign of terror should be over, but at the very least, Hokumoko has pushed in. They've managed to take this entire section. They have all this reclaim, all 1,500 reclaim here. Obviously, taking it right now is a bad idea. They need the energy in order to make that work. But if they get the energy, then it's fine. And the south side of the map as well, we mentioned before, that has fallen as well. There is a conjurer doing what it can to find room, but this is it. This is this force here for Gaiop is all they have to try to rebuild. They are getting the metal structures back up, which is exactly what I'd expect them to do. But, still a question of how they're going to get in here. With all the defenses coming in here, and yeah, the Reavers can push in. They can deal some damage. But Hokumoku's commander upgraded with a machine gun as well, so it's essentially a Reaver of its own. But it's not quite enough, and Gaiop knows it. Pushing forward with the Reavers, they should lose two, maybe three. But then, this entire backline is going to fall. And the commander wisely retreating from this as Gaiop manages to retake the position in the center... Doesn't lose a whole lot of reclaim either, so sending in a handful of conjurers should take that back if they manage to do that as effectively as they do. But of course, on the south side of the map, we do see that Okamoko is not taking that line down. Despite losing the northern side and losing a lot of ground over to the north, they're pushing in for the win. They want to get rid of Gaiop's main base, and there's not a whole lot Gaiop can do to stop this, not when you're dealing with 24 glaives and reinforcements, 30 glaives coming in here. That is more than enough to get rid of everything here. The, the meager defenses that have been built up, even with the Reavers, it's not enough. The Reavers will be overwhelmed. They're getting a lot of value, though. That's, I think, the more key thing. They're getting enough value that the Lotus is able to get this here. They are able to get some damage in, but again, the sheer reinforcements, the stream of Glaives coming in means the Fusion Plant's down. And with the Fusion Plant down, Hokumoko is at a massive energy advantage. That was the majority of Gaia's energy infrastructure, was that one Fusion. And on top of that, the factory going down, I mean... Guy up, they had a really strong chance if it weren't for that attack. But Hokumoko, they've basically they've knocked Guy up down at the knees, and I don't know if Guy's gonna throw in the towel, but it seems like it is a good time for towels. And it's a good time to remind you there is in fact a towel mode. 
There is a towel emote. Shadow 156 towel is the towel on stream. Sorry, for people on YouTube, sorry about that. The towel is not on YouTube because YouTube doesn't do emotes. But if you watch the stream on Twitch, you get emotes. And you can throw in the towel if you want to do that. However, guy up does dive does. I was like, guy up does not there. Rebuilding. No, that's that's towel. That is that is towel. So it was good. Definitely a thing that happened, but with that, Hokumoko is going to be advanced. Well, not advancing, but advan they're going to be getting an extra point. Overall, though, I'm quite impressed by how well the guy managed to hold on because we look at the metal used graph. Hokumoko had a metal used advantage for about three minutes. That wasn't just that last little assault, that was actually quite a bit. And unit value as well. For the majority of the game, Hokumoko had a unit value advantage, and guy up just managed to hold on, but I think. If that 30 glaive assault in the south, if there was more defenses, a stardust, like a single stardust had been built up, or a couple sky dust or something, well, stardust on platform, if those had been built up along the choke point, stopping the glaives from getting in, that would have played out very differently, because Hokomoko was taking the north, and with reinforcements, they could have easily swept the north, gotten rid of all the glaives coming in, because they were going in hard reavers, so the glaives would have had no chance, especially streaming in one at a time, and could have easily taken out most of Hokomoko's economy, and there wasn't much to stop them. Especially with the naked expands, a couple some supporting glaives around the side with some gremlins to stop the the harpies from having a field day. That could have been a massively effective strategy, but unfortunately for them, Hokomoko played it exactly right with the timing attack over these glaives. And not just a timing attack, just a just a strong flanking assault. Gaia had not prepared for that. Sorry, Hokomoko. Yeah, Gaia had not prepared for that. Hokomoko had prepared for that. Hokomoko takes it. Well done, Hokomoko. Coming back from an energy deficit to turn that into a very strong lead. So anyway, at this point, we do have, I think, Google Rock and Dying Freund apparently still going on. But I'm not entirely sure. It looks like everywhere everywhere else, every other match has ended. So we might just be going on around round 6 immediately. See how that is going, because I'm not sure what's going on with, that, with the Dying Freund game. Let's see, Google Frog and Dying Freund is still ongoing. I oh, suppose we should check that out. I mean... Google Frog and Dying Friend, that's going to be potentially a really good match. I mean, Google Frog is pretty much the best active player, and Dying Friend is the most active 1v1 player right now. So I'm interested to see how that is going to pan out, all things considered, because, you know, activity, activity and skill versus experience and long term experience. How is that going to play? So, right off the bat, Cloaky v Cloaky again, as looks like. Dying Friends managed to get a lot of economy way faster than we saw before. Although, admittedly, part of that is because it is sped up. Yeah, very quick forward economy production. Google Frog, not so much. Google Frog playing a little more conservatively, but still managing to get the mountainous economy over the northwest. And Dying Friend again going for that assault, losing a, few, a handful of glaives in the process, but not all that many, all things considered. And that is going to be. That's going to be a fairly strong position to work from. Oh, and Imps. We never saw Imps last game, now that I think about it. That would be a nice thing to see. Maybe we'll see more of them later on. At this point, though, Google Frog managing to maintain enough southern control, but Dime Friends essentially split this map in half. So Google Frog at this point should be able to get rid of a few of the forces, but Dime Friend with that map split does have the money to maintain a strong defensive force. Actually, that's leaving Google Frog in a harder and harder position as Swift's coming in, taking pot shots at the glaze with very little in response means that Google Frog is going to have a difficult time holding the front line, but they're not having an impossible time. They do have a strong position to get rid of these Ronin from, and they are taking it! Getting rid of all of them, possibly open up the commander to be destroyed as Dimefriend... Oh yeah, their commander is very likely to go down. Dimefriend, they do have the Lotuses. That is the one asset they really have working on. But still, it's the question of what to approach, because at this point, Dimefriend's static defenses, that's their main strength. And Google Frog, not quite able to... Well, not quite able to delete that as quickly as they'd like to, and now Google Frog turning that actually into a disadvantage. Dying Friend with 6,000 metal attrition on top of the metal advantage. They are turning that defensive play into an offensive play, essentially leading Google Frog into a trap as Google Frog throws in the towel before we even get caught up, just because of all those defenses there. And we see that Google Frog did have fewer metal, okay, less metal use as well. But, yeah, a lot of that was losing their entire army to these lotuses. That was a bit of damage done earlier as well, but, now yeah, it was a Big thing I saw there. 
Oh. Yeah, unfortunately I had to catch up on that one. I... I guess both of them are reasonably even in terms of time spent. So, with that, we are on to round six. As round six is going to be... Well, starting in... Second, as soon as we get a chance to get it started. I'm not sure what's going to happen exactly in terms of what I want to cast. feel like I want to cast... I want to cast Nemor. Yeah, I have a Nemor. I haven't seen Nemor at all. That's the only player I haven't seen yet. I want to see how they play. I think round six... I'm trying to remember what map round six is. Archer's Valley. Ooh. Well, I mean, to be fair, I thought that this would be a long set, and it turned out to be 15 minutes. So it probably won't be that long in Archer's Valley. I mean, maybe it will. Archer's Valley can be a long map. It is a fairly large map. But it's often, like, you know, spider mirrors or gunship mirrors. Uh, types of maps that tend to finish fairly quickly. Or matches that tend to finish fairly quickly. So I don't... I don't know how long it'll take. Also, Kingstead pointing out in the, not the Twitch chat, but the 0k chat, asking if no one went spiders. And it, I don't know if anyone did. I mean, I only saw two matches, so I'm not really sure. But, yeah, spiders would be interesting on that map, but I think the map is just too big to make them work well. Spiders have a hard time on large maps and on flat maps, and the map is fairly flat. Yeah, there's mountains in it, but it's not like, say, Archer's Valley, where there's a lot of room for a lot of terrain changes. It's more just choke pointy. I, it's almost more like a StarCraft map. So it, it's effectively a flat map with choke points. And yeah, you can get rid of the choke points using spiders, but you don't move that fast. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Still, though, I would like to see spiders on that, since spiders, that's kind of my favorite ground factory. That is my favorite ground factory. I love seeing spiders played well. I kind of hope we see that too with Archer's Valley, because I have seen spiders play in Archer's Valley a fair bit, but at the same time, it's a map that's again big and flat. It's just less flat. Less flat enough that it's often worth it. 